This tune is more popular than I realized that it was. I knew about it, but didn't really understand that in a lot of places it's actually become pretty much expected that it might be called it a jam session. So let's take a closer look today at Strasbourg Saint Denis. Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Pat Rubicki. Thanks for joining me today. Look for a PDF below related to this bass line that we're talking about, which is a tune by the great Roy Hargrove called Strasbourg Saint Denis. And the bass player on this and in Roy's band for a fair bit of time, I think, was Danton Bowler, an excellent bass player. I don't know who wrote this bass line, but to me, it's kind of the perfect bass line in some ways that we'll discuss in a second. But let's just talk about the tune itself real quick. It is a very simple thing to memorize. It's just eight measures. It's all in A flat major, but the, we don't get to the tonic, the root of the chord, until sort of the very end of that eight measure cycle. And the chords basically don't change the whole time. There are variations in everybody's interpretation of things, but essentially there's not like a different, it doesn't go to a bridge, for example, right? And it doesn't go to another key necessarily unless the improvisers dictate that. So it's a pretty simple tune to deal with, but when we have this simplicity, the simplicity of this great feel, the simplicity of this line, we've got a lot of things to play with, which is great. Sort of similar to modal music, right? It gives you more room for creativity. So this tune, the feel is like what we would call sort of a funk or almost like a, I don't wanna say pseudo funk because it is funky to me, like I really enjoy it. It's not like 60s funk, you know what I mean? It's not the mothership calling, it's a different kind of thing. That said, like, I love it. You probably see me smiling when I play it. How can you not smile when you hear and play this song? And you know, there is a video, <clears throat> excuse me, a live performance of Roy and this band doing this tune. It's got like 2 million views on YouTube. And if you haven't seen it, I'll link to it below. There's also another video uh, that is live with a later band with Amin Salim on bass. And there's sort of an extended bass intro, which I think is fantastic. And I don't know that that gets as much attention as this other live recording that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna to link to that as well. I think there's a lot of opportunity with this tune to do a lot of sort of um, playful things. And I mean that not in a corny way, you know, but just in a, in a way of like feeling good. You know, sometimes, a lot of times we just wanna play stuff that feels good. Audiences wanna hear things that feels good. So why not play something that feels good, you know? So. Part of the reason I think that this bass line is so great is that it is a balance of some things that are sort of opposites. So first let's talk about the, the articulation specifically of the line itself. One thing is the first phrase, it's got um, a short, long, short, long, long. So short, long, short, long, long. That articulation is gonna make a difference in how it's perceived by other people and how you sort of feel it in your body. So that's one thing that I think is a helpful thing to grab onto. Also, when you're considering that basically there's this three, rep the three repetitions of this ascending and descending thing going to the D flat. So we have B flat minor seven, um, he's playing the root, C minor seven, playing the root, and D flat major seven. And then there's a turnaround, basically, a, a, a two beats essentially of getting back to the B flat. Um, he plays C, F, C, and then he repeats B flat, B flat, C, D flat. And now here's this cool moment of another sort of opposite in a sense, or the first opposite I'm talking about, where you've got these long notes, basically these notes that are held, and now here's a little, puzzle piece pulled out or whatever you want to say, some little injection of this fast drop that not only sets up the B flat major again, B, I'm sorry, the B flat minor seven again, but also allows for a little rest and a little space. You hear um, uh, Montez Coleman puts a little vibe on that. Every, you know, every time they sort of get into it, that space is a great place for people to make very sort of um, aggressive statements that are so fun to play and listen to. So now we're on to the next four bars. He repeats B flat major, B flat minor seven, right? And now we're walking to the five E flat dominant, 
Yeah, there's the, the root of e, uh, e flat uh, seven. Some people say E flat sus. I'm not exactly sure there. But then he does a um, sort of diatonic enclosure going to A flat, G, B flat, G, B flat, A flat. And then it's just one, five, one, A flat, E flat, A flat. And then a chromatic descent back to F7, flat nine, which is the five of B flat minor seven, which is gonna start the whole cycle again. That's the F7. One little point I wanted to make is that in some transcriptions I've seen of people doing this and in hearing some people do it, it's not super important, but Danton actually plays a little sort of uh, 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 enclosure in a sense too, to get back to the B flat. He plays a uh, C, G, F, G, F, and he changes that slightly now and again. This, there's like four repetitions of this whole eight bar thing. Uh, but for what it's worth, I wanted you to know it was there. <laughs> and also it's a little bit interesting if you think about it that the melody note is a flat nine. It's F7 flat nine. To my understanding, I'm pretty sure I hear that that is a flat nine. That C, I'm sorry, that G natural is a natural nine. So he's playing a natural nine on a flat nine. But it works for a couple reasons. That flat nine, the G flat is held out. That G comes a little bit later, then it's not hitting at the same time as the G flat. And also it's a purpose. It has a purpose. It is surrounding the note F. C, G, F. You're basically, the intention is the F. So it doesn't matter so much that technically that's a minor second rub there or minor ninth, however you want to say it. There's a, there's a rub there. It doesn't matter. So this happens several times, as I say. And then when we get into the piano solo, Joe Clayton on piano, an amazing pianist who's on uh, my album too, which I think we recorded around the same time as this album. Um, but Joe plays his butt off every time <laughs> I hear him. Um, anyway, so the beginning of Gerald's solo, Danton is changing, immediately is changing the feel as an alternate rhythmic thing that's going on. Um, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Basically, he is allowing for the aspect of the, the funk feel where the bass and the drums have to uh, give each other space and not just give space, but actually lock in like cogs, like turning cogs on a wheel when the drum isn't playing a strong thing, the bass is playing a strong thing. When the bass is playing a strong thing, the drums aren't playing a strong thing. That's very, very simplified, right? But basically we, leaving space for the drums in a funk feel is very authentic. It's very fun. <laughs> it feels really good. And, you know, it doesn't crowd the sense of what the feeling of the music is, which is great. Sort of parenthetically, you know, I, one time um, Winton said to me, like, we, we were... Um, in like a improv class at Juilliard and he was talking to the group of us, something about articulation and how, when you listen to like salsa horn players, the rhythms they play and the articulations, they're so perfect. They're so locked in. They're so in the groove as well. They're not only locked in with each other, but they are precisely placed. Everything in, in a salsa band uh, is precisely placed rhythmically. Why don't we give that same attention to the rhythms that are placed in the swing feel. It's kind of weird, like, I'm not saying play uptight, but rather to consider so carefully how the bass and drums fit together in the swing feel is just as important as in the funk feel, in the salsa feel, in the Afro-Cuban feel, and so on and so forth. So something to think about. This tune is a lot of fun to play anytime. <laughs> and it allows for, as I said at the beginning, a lot of, um, opportunity for experimentation, um, building up, or orchestrating sort of things, like building up the vibe, building up the intensity, leaving, dropping back down, lots of sort of theatrical moments, dramatic moments. And it also is greatly focused on the rhythm itself. There's not a whole lot going on harmonically or in the bass line, unless you want it to be, but it just leaves space for a lot of fun things to happen. So play with this as much as you can and get out and play with other people. That's the main thing, right? Go to these jam sessions where it's so popular. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I hope it was helpful and look for that PDF below. And as always, straight ahead and strive for tone.